Hello, I hope you're well. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today's video is one of those quarantine reads videos. So I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I've read since my own quarantine slash lockdown started in early March. Reading in this instance has definitely been that famous escape that everyone talks about. So we're gonna talk about the 15 books that I read basically between March and end of June. Anything that I read in July is in my July reading wrap up, which I'll link somewhere. <laughs> a lot of these books are historical fiction, surprise, surprise. And I was actually really excited to see that several of them are women in translation, which is great since the month of August is women in translation month. So I thought that was a really, really nice tie in and just wanted to let everyone know. You know the drill, so let's get started. So the first book I want to talk about is Lady Clementine by Marie Benedict. It is the story of Clementine Churchill. It starts around the time that Clementine meets Winston Churchill and goes until about the end of World War II. This is not hard-hitting literary fiction. I would actually say it's on the fluffier side, which was fantastic for reading it in the middle of a pandemic. If you like sweet, relatively happily ever after romances, the marriage between the Churchills in this is just that. But what I really enjoyed about this book in particular is that you really get more of a sense of who Clementine Churchill is as an individual. You learn a little bit more about her own impact on the war efforts and her own accomplishments, which are so often overshadowed by Churchill himself. And you also learn a lot about how dependent Winston Churchill was on his wife. So yeah, I really enjoyed this and it made me order a biography on Clementine Churchill before I'd even finished the book because I couldn't get enough and she became one of my historical girl crushes that I have alluded to probably in every video I've done up to this point. Um, I gave it three stars. It was enjoyable. I kind of wish that it wasn't as fluffy, but like I said, it was really good timing considering everything else that was going on in the world at the time. And speaking of biographies on Clementine Churchill, the next book is Clementine, The Life of Mrs. Winston Churchill by Sonia Purnell. I read this immediately after reading the novel and thought it was a phenomenal work of nonfiction. It was accessible and easy to read and digestible. What I really enjoyed about this was the fact that you, you get to hear a lot about what Clementine Churchill did in the two world wars, but especially the second world war where she was heavily involved on on the home front while Churchill himself was focused on what was going on elsewhere. So she was really led the charge on making sure that the bomb shelters in England were habitable and she volunteered in some of the more dangerous kind of volunteer work you could do, which was standing on a rooftop and looking out for fires at night while the Germans are dropping bombs. So it was interesting to really see her impact there and also to see just how crucial she was to Churchill's political life, as far as campaigning for him at certain points, being sitting in on meetings with him when most people didn't think women belonged in politics, helping him with his speeches, the enormity of her influence you can really feel in this book. When I finished it, I had so much more respect for Clementine, or Clemmy. Mrs. Churchill, Lady Churchill, she has a lot of titles. I gave this a four. I really, really enjoyed it. You know what? I'm gonna give it a five. <laughs> I've talked myself into it. I think I gave it a four. Um, I'm bumping it up to a five because I really haven't stopped talking about this book since I read it. The next book I listened to as an audiobook and that is The Queen's Fortune by Alison Pataki, but it is about the lesser known love interest of Napoleon Bonaparte, Desiree Clary. She's actually the woman that Napoleon jilts for Josephine. Essentially Desiree Clary knows and falls in love with Napoleon Bonaparte when he is just a Corsican soldier. They remain in each other's orbits, 
basically their entire lives. Desiree's sister ends up marrying into Bonaparte's family, but you also have Desiree forming a relationship with Josephine, the woman that Napoleon left her for. And towards the end, Desiree really has a, a degree of respect for jo Empress Josephine which is really interesting to see. There isn't a rivalry. They end up coexisting rather peaceably throughout their lives. In the end, Desiree doesn't do too badly herself. She ends up becoming the queen consort, yeah, the queen of Sweden. And funnily enough, her son ends up marrying one of Josephine's granddaughters. So it kind of comes full circle. But I did give it four stars. I really enjoyed the audiobook version. The narrator was very pleasant to listen to. This book led to a rabbit hole of me searching for more Napoleonic War focused historical fiction. Speaking of Napoleonic War books, we have the Josephine B trilogy up next, which is the first book, The Many Lives and Secret Sorrows of Josephine B and then Tales of Passion, Tales of Woe, both by Sandra Guland. I've read the third book in the trilogy and reviewed it in my July wrap-up if you're interested. These are novelizations of the entire life of Josephine Bonaparte, written in the form of diary entries from Josephine herself. The first book in the series, The Many Lives and Secret Sorrows of Josephine B, it follows her from Martinique to Paris through her first marriage, through the French Revolution, where she was a victim of the Reign of Terror, narrowly escaped being guillotined, her husband was not so fortunate, and then the book really takes you through what is her attempt at surviving post-Reign of Terror in Paris with the revolutionary governments in place. She has two children, she's a widow, and she meets and falls in love with Napoleon. The second book in the series, Tales of Passion, Tales of Woe, picks up immediately after where this one leaves off. They are newlyweds and it goes up until the point that, that Napoleon is about to be declared emperor. This touches upon the political intrigues of these revolutionary governments, the backstabbing, the scheming. It gives you a real sense of what's going on in France during this time. I'd have to say both are really insightful into that time period. Just as a note, all of the books do have footnotes, which I found interesting as they give a little bit more historical context in places where things might not be as obvious. I found it useful. Some people might find it distracting. Um, I gave book one four stars. I really, really enjoyed it, particularly as it pertained to the Reign of Terror. And then I gave the second book a three, which is also what I believe I gave the third book. Next up is The Book of Anna by Carmen Blausa. It is one of the translations that I was talking about. So this book was actually translated from Spanish. Essentially, this is inception in book form. <laughs> Leo Tolstoy based his novel Anna Karenina off of a living, breathing, flesh and blood woman, Anna Karenina. So that's what I mean by inception. Like it's a book about a book that isn't a book, but is a book and some of the characters, particularly Sergei, Anna's son, acknowledges the fact that he feels like he's a character and not a real person. So it's really, really trippy. It's kind of cool in that it picks up years after Anna Karenina's death, where both of her children, Sergei and Anya, are grown men and women. It's basically taking place as the revolutionary movement in Russia is starting to really gain traction. So there are a lot of anarchists running around, planting bombs, having secret meetings. They cover Bloody Sunday in 1905 with Father Gapone leading this protest or march on the Winter Palace that the Tsar and the military subdue by killing and wounding a really upsetting number of people. So it's really interesting to be set in that sort of watershed moment. For someone who considers Anna Karenina one of her favorite books of all time, it was interesting to see this treatment of Anna Karenina because I wouldn't necessarily call it a sequel. 
but it really turns what we know about Anna Karenina on its head, which was really refreshing. I gave this four stars. <laughs> the next book I read is one that I've already unhauled, Show Them a Good Time by Nicole Flattery. It's a short story collection, which I'm going to say up front is not something that I'm ticked particularly drawn to. I probably bought this book in part because of the cover. It vaguely reminded me of Gustav Klimt, but I did actually like the idea, which was these short stories about womanhood and early to mid life stasis and indirection. Even with those pre with the premise, I felt reading this was a slog. I didn't particularly enjoy the characters or the stories. It felt rather tedious to me. I kept seeing references to the humor of the book and if there was humor it went completely over my head. I just didn't see it. I felt that some of the stories were much longer than they needed to be and I felt the pacing was off and I just really didn't enjoy it so I gave it two stars. The next book is Sin Eater by Megan Camp Campisi. This is a hard one to place. It's, I want to say that it's alternate universe historical fiction, if that's a thing. Does that make it fantasy? I'm not, <laughs> not really sure. But it's basically set in what is an alternate 16th century England, 16th century England, and it's about sin eaters, these ostracized women who hear the confessions of the dying and by consuming certain foods that have sins attributed to them, they take the sin upon themselves and absolve the dying person. And this was apparently an actual thing. Yeah, so one of the author's notes is that this existed in Britain until roughly a century ago. The main character, May, is a 14-year-old girl who commits a crime and her punishment is to be made into a sin eater. It really follows May down this investigative rabbit hole of trying to figure out why these foods for these brave sins keep appearing on coffins of people in the royal household. And I feel like in all books it comes a life or death situation for dear old <laughs> old May. I gave it three stars. I really liked that it explored this facet of British history with the Sin Eaters that I had never heard about. But it did read a little bit young for me. The, ca the main character is 14 years old. I'm not a huge YA reader. But I do have to give props to Megan Campisi for writing a novel where for the majority of it the main character cannot speak so you're literally in her head the entire time. So the next book is The Governesses by Anne Serre. <laughs> it is a very small novella, just over 100 pages long, and this is translated from French and it is basically about these three governesses who don't really do much minding of the children. Actually, they spend most of their time kind of in this dreamlike state and seducing and devouring <laughs> in a ladylike manner suitors, innocent suitors, who just happen to mistakenly step foot into the garden. There is a very dreamlike fairy tale-esque way about it, but it is it is he's not a kid-friendly fairy tale at all. It's kind of erotic <laughs> and dark and 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 maybe a bit existential. It was kind of weird in a good way. So, I gave this 3 stars. If you like kind of experimental fiction, I think this I think this would I think this would kind of do it. Next book is Euphoria by Lily King. I read this in a Saturday. It was so good. It's set in the 1930s. It's about these three anthropologists studying river tribes in Papua New Guinea and this love triangle, love triangle that forms during their anthropological expedition. I thought it was interesting to kind of hear the discussions of how the field of anthropology was changing around that time, which was really cool. So I did give it five stars. Up next, 
conjure women by Afia Atakura, more historical fiction that is set in America for a change. So it takes place basically just before, during, and after the Civil War. The main characters are Miss Maybell and her daughter Rue, who are former slaves. Miss Maybell is a healer and midwife and her daughter Rue follows in her footsteps. What I enjoyed about this book was the fact that in reading it I realized that many of the Civil War focused historical fiction that I've read has been told from the perspective of the white characters or has been written by a white author. That was not the case here. This book is told through the lens of the slaves slash former slaves and it was written by an own voice author and I think made it unique and nuanced in that capacity and it was interesting to kind of see that these former slaves are living in essentially a freeman's town on or near what used to be the plantation they worked and there's this conflict of Christian religion and superstition that kind of comes into play and how Rue, who's a healer, conjure woman, fits in and the conflicts that arise there and the story too is largely about the relationship of Rue, a former slave, and her former mistress, Rina and their relationships are highly nuanced and if this five star would highly recommend we have the vanished birds by simon jimenez the book itself is about naya imani a ship captain who travels through space and time and ends up becoming this mother-like figure to this young boy named arrow whose uniqueness makes him of interest to this tech-based society not necessarily in a good way the book itself has a lot to do with found families, whether it's Naya Amani and Arrow or the entire crew itself and what one's willing to do for said found family. The world building is phenomenal. I, as someone who does not read science fiction, I can attest to the fact that I had no problem visualizing the world that these characters were living in. That being said, it was probably a bit too sci-fi-y for me. I do better with things that are more grounded in the real world, <laughs> I guess. I did give it three stars, not from any fault of the book, it's just not a genre that I connect with as easily. So there you go. Next up is Margaret the First by Daniel Dutton. Another really short novel that I read and it is about Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle. She is a 17th century figure living around the time of the English Civil War with Cromwell. She is a fascinating individual who I knew nothing about prior to reading this book. She was a prolific writer during her time when if women published they were publishing anonymously and she was producing plays and poems and writing about natural science and gender politics. One of her books, The Blazing World, is considered one of the earliest examples of science fiction. I wouldn't say that this has a plot unless you consider someone's life a plot. I gave it three stars largely because although I did enjoy it, I think the lack of an actual plot is probably a strike against. Next book is Salt to the Sea by Ruta Sepetis. This is a novel set during World War II told from the the alternating perspectives of four refugees. These four storylines eventually converge to so much to the point that you will actually see all four sides of a particular moment in time or particular situation. Their stories converge on the Wilhelm Gustav, which was a ship I knew nothing about historically. It's supposed to be taking them to safety, but as the back of the book says, but not all promises can be kept. But the Wilhelm Gustloff is this horrific maritime disaster that, that does dwarf both the Lusitania and the Titanic. I didn't know what to expect. I bought this ages and ages ago, so when I picked it up to read I actually thought it was a more modern story. I did give it four stars, so not too bad. The last 
book is More Miracle Than Bird by Alice Miller. This is a World War One story set in London. It is essentially about the courtship of Georgie Hyde Lees and W.B. Yeats. I would say this is a pretty atmospheric novel. There is obviously world, the world war looming over everything and also this secret society that Yates and Georgie end up getting involved in, which I lol'd because the book is considered occult fiction because of this group that is into like seances and spiritualism and all that kind of thing. I would say that the courtship isn't necessarily a happy one, it's actually kind of tempestuous, probably a little bit darker than I anticipated, but that all kind of leans hard into this atmospheric book. I really enjoyed it as far as being kind of this dark romance. Definitely not the fluffy one that I started this video out with. <laughs> so with that, I have gone through all 15 books that I read between March and June. I hope you found some books to add to your TBR. I really appreciate you watching. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. I will see you all in my next video. Bye!